Washington Journal continues. We want to welcome back to C-SPAN, Eric Cantor. He's the House Minority Leader and a, a Republican from Virginia's 7th Congressional District. Congressman, thanks for being with us. So good to be with you. We want to talk about the Republican Party. We want to talk about the issue of health care. Let me begin by showing you an excerpt of what the President said last night on the ABC program in regard to how this program, these changes in health care, will be paid. Here's an excerpt from the East Room of the White House last night. Easy. Problem. If it was easy, it would have been solved a long time ago because we've been talking about this for decades. Uh, since Harry Truman, uh, we've been talking about how do we provide care that is high, high quality, gives people choices, and how can we come up with a uniquely American plan? Because uh, one of the ideological debates that I think has prevented us from making progress is some people say this is socialized medicine, others say we need a completely free market system. We need to come up with something that is uniquely American. Now, what I've said is that if we are smart, we should be able to design a system in which people still have choices of doctors and choices of plans, that make sure that the necessary treatment is provided, but we don't have a huge amount of waste in the system, that we are providing adequate coverage for all people, uh, and that we are driving down costs over the long term. If we don't drive down costs, then we're not going to be able to achieve all those other things. So, Eric Cantor, a congressman from Virginia, let me ask you generally, where is this legislation? Well, uh, you know, obviously it has hit uh, a few speed bumps over the last couple of weeks. Uh, when we see the real cost of the legislation beginning to come out uh, with the Congressional Budget Office uh, saying on the one hand that the Senate finance bill costing 1.6 trillion and I'm hearing estimates of the House bill over 3 trillion dollars. Um, it brings into question, you know, this whole notion that we're going to be bringing down health care costs. And, you know, if you're looking at spending that kind of money, it is clearly money that we don't have. The main concern I think that most Americans have about the notion of a government health care plan is that they won't have the ability to choose their doctor. They won't have the ability for their doctor to prescribe a certain procedure because it will all be dictated by Washington. And, and long term, the consequences um, are pretty evident that there will be tens of millions of people coming off of the plans that they have now that they like and having to go on to a government plan, uh, which is exactly the opposite of what the president begins every one of his statements about. That is, if you like what you have, you can keep it. That's just not the case if you create a government plan. Well, let me follow up on that point, because that seems to be the line of question that we've been getting from Republicans as they talk to Christina Romer and others who have been outlining details of the president's plan. Why is that not the case? Why do you think that if you have a plan, you won't be able to keep it? Because if you have the government, um, as as many as everyone I've spoken to in the administration has indicated, if you have a government plan the way they want to compete with the private sector, there's no way that you have an even playing field. You can't have an even playing field if plans that are operating right now in the states. How do you have a federal government that has to be regulated by a state? There's something I think counter to the Constitution in that. You can't have a government plan compete fairly with the private sector. And if that is the case, uh, what you will do is see that the government have uh, unfair advantage. You will see many plans begin to collapse and people being transferred or being chased off of the plans they've got and then be forced into a plan only designed by the government and this town beginning to tell people what their health care coverage has got to look like. Let me put another issue on the table this morning. The New York Times previewing a meeting that will take place today between the President and some members of Congress on the issue of immigration. This is an issue that President Bush tried to deal with in his administration. Uh, nothing has seemed to come about. Will anything change? And if so, what do you want changed? Steve, look, right now, I don't care what your background is, from what country you have uh, come to America uh, uh, in, a, in a legal way, where you live in this country, number one priority is the economy. People are fearful of their economic future. We've got to be focusing on jobs. And it confounds me as to how this president, this administration, can't seem to focus on priority one. In the House today, you know, we're listening and watching Speaker Pelosi try to man her offense to get the vote she needs to pass a national energy tax. Then you've got the president meeting with members on immigration. 
let's try and address the number one issue. When you've got already admissions by the White House that we're going to have 10% unemployment in this country, um, that's one out of every 10 families not having a paycheck at the end of the month. Ought we not be focusing on that priority first? That's my response to this. I mean, obviously, look, we've got plenty of other issues that we need to deal with. At the end of the day, this president seems to be spending money that we don't have. Uh, and the consequences and costs of this agenda are beginning to impact people. And that's why you're seeing the polls and the American people wake up to the fact that they don't agree with the policy agenda being promoted. So when President Obama says these are issues that he has to deal with because they're issues that he has inherited from the previous administration, you say what? Listen, I mean, I don't think that the American people are into the blame game here. I mean, they they want to see solutions. They want to see a Washington that will work together. They want to see leadership, not partisanship. And I think when you start to say, "Oh, we inherited this. This is the other regime, the other administration's fault." Okay, fine. If you want to do finger pointing, I think the American people are sick and tired of that, and they want some deliverables and some results. Congressman Cantor has been in the House for the last uh, nine, nine and a half years. Gene is joining us on the phone from Richmond, Virginia. Good morning, Republican line. Uh, good morning, and thank you for C-SPAN. I don't understand why people think they deserve free health care. I lived in a, in, in a socialist country for five years. It's, it's a joke. It's a joke. I had to diagnose mononucleosis for my son. They'd never heard of it. it it's frightening. We can't afford this. We can't afford to be distracted from the cap and trade they're trying to do tomorrow. I I'm very, 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 very worried. That's it. Thank you, Gene. Well, Gene, thanks for Richmond there. And, uh, you know, I share the concern uh, that we are seeing an administration that lacks the focus on the number one priority that we need to be about right now. Um, and that is getting this economy back on track. But Let's isn't health care part of the economy? Well, sure, the health care is a part of the economy, but if you don't have jobs, the way this health care system works in our country, you're not going to have health care coverage because most people, as we know, Steve, get their health care coverage through their job. In fact, 70% of Americans do. Uh, and so we ought to be focusing on, number one, the jobs. And number two, if health care is... Um, is going to be the cost factor that it is in terms of businesses out there. We need to address and we need to implement reform because if we don't, you'll have businesses exiting uh, the business of providing health care coverage to their employees and then we'll end up exactly where we don't want to end up, which is a government-imposed plan prescribing how people's coverage should look like and Washington deciding what doctors and what treatment you get. So Donna has this uh, comment that she sent to us at Twitter.com, CSPENWJ. Please ask him what exactly is their plan, the Republican plan in detail, not just say what's wrong with the president's policies. Donna, absolutely. You know, the Republican plan starts with the notion that we need to be patient-centered. We need to have the ability for choice. Let's start with where this health care system is today. Our plan says you've got to provide more flexibility uh, to employers who've already demonstrated the ability to bring down costs. So we address that by saying that employers should have, especially those operating in ERISA plans, more flexibility to reward good behavior, to reward healthy living so that you can bring down costs. Uh, we also say uh, that, that you ought to make sure if you're going to have and address a plan of access for those people uninsured. Most of the people that are uninsured are uninsured because health care is too costly. So let's allow those individuals, and our plan says allow those individuals to access um, a larger pool of people so small businesses, individuals can get into a much larger pool and then insurance companies say that the risk is then spread out over a lot more people and therefore we can bring down costs. So we want to have access for people to, to get into affordable coverage. And our plan would say we want to subsidize uh, those individuals, help them with their premium payments so that they can have access to a basic plan. What we don't want is Washington or any state government sitting here saying that you have to have the kind of plan that we say you have to have. That's where we've gone wrong in this country. Uh, we've gone wrong because the, the government has said this is going to be the plan, this is 
going to be uh, the uh, price that we pay the providers. Um, and, and so we try and address this terrible price fixing that's going on through the government right now, that we say the best doctor in the world gets paid the, the, the same as the worst doctor in this country. Same goes for hospitals. That's what's wrong with the plan. We try and address what's wrong with the system, improve upon it, not go about trying to spend a trillion six hundred billion dollars in, in some new bloated government plan. We can't afford that. That's money we don't have and we'll end up with a system like we've got in the UK or the Canada where people can't get in to see their physician. They're having to, to go without care and it, it, this country should never have to be put in that situation. There are three or four key House committees uh, drafting the legislation on health care. One of them is a Ways and Means Committee. Our guest, Congressman Cantor, serves on that committee. He's a graduate of George Washington University. Earned his law degree from William and Mary. Also studied at Columbia University. Next caller is Charlotte on the Democrats' line from Boca Raton, Florida. Yes. Uh, uh, good morning. Um, let me say this first. I'll tell you. Charlotte, we. Yes. Are you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, I'd like to say what's gone wrong is that uh, we have relied on the insurance companies. We have relied on the insurance companies for so long and that if you think that the insurance companies down the line are going to cooperate and keep uh, people insured who have prior health problems, uh, I think that you have no credibility. Here's my, and you talk about quality, if you can't afford health insurance or going to a doctor, what good is the quality only for the wealthy? Uh, let, let me try and address that, Charlotte, and thanks for calling in. Number one, you speak of you know, individuals that have pre-existing conditions and the inability for them to get coverage. That is a huge problem because most people, I think, right now uh, are concerned about their job, and if they lose their job, then they lose their insurance coverage, and then as an individual are unlikely to be able to go and afford coverage on their own, uh, which is exactly why the Republican plan has in it flexibility so that we can ensure people don't lose uh, their health care coverage if they lose their job. Uh, you are also right in saying if people can't afford coverage, what good is quality? That's exactly the point here. So what we need to do is we need to take out the prescription here in Washington which says you every American's got to have XYZ type of coverage. What we need to do is provide a field of choice for people in terms of basic coverage. And then we build upon that and, and create competition among and choice for people so that they can choose what they can afford and what their family needs. Right now the problem is too many people in this country are going without insurance because it costs too much. It costs too much, number one, because the government is in the game of price fixing. We've got a lot, a lot of cost shifting going on, and so it's being borne by you know, the uh, businesses out there and the individuals who have to pay themselves, not the government. Uh, but also, uh, we have a situation where states and, fe and the federal government have said, we, we are going to continue to raise the requirements of what a plan should look like. If we say, look, we've got to make sure that people are not fearful of losing their life savings. I mean, think about it. If there is a father out there who has to spend his life savings uh, trying to cure his son of cancer, you know, we can't let that individual do that and go into bankruptcy. The government needs to be able to step into a situ situation like that uh, and help an individual in that circumstance. So we need to provide affordable access to coverage, and that really means basic coverage. You won't get there with a the government plan. A government plan is all about saying, here's a design, here's what the plan needs to look like. Our guest is the House Republican Whip. Dean is on the phone from Florence, Arizona. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, gentlemen? Good morning. And thank you for the C-SPAN. First of all, I have a comment. Thank you, Mr. Obama, for the $80 billion you got out of the drug companies. Now, um, uh, I have talked to many health care uh, people that are out there that work inside the hospitals. They are all for the new uh, uh, computers to take and load down all the patient's information. They think that's the best idea in the world, as long as it does not get into the public's hand. That's the one problem, and that's the big concern they do have. 
second of all, and you made a comment about Canada, I happen to have at least 30 friends out in Canada. They've never had a problem taking and getting in to see a doctor right away. So there's where you were wrong, sir. And have a nice day, and I'd like to hear your comments. Sure. Um, first of all, the... Um the issue of privacy in terms of health IT or information technology is a real one. We want to make sure people um, have the protection so that their health information is not shared with those who don't need to see it. Uh, and so we, we've got laws in place. They need to be enforced. Uh, and as we continue to step towards trying to gain some efficiency of cost and using information technology, you raise a very valid concern. As far as Canada, uh, you know, I think Dean, maybe your anecdotal uh, evidence is different than uh, the ones that I have, the one that I have seen. There's no question that the data indicates in some of the systems, in the UK in particular, God forbid you're a woman who's been diagnosed with breast cancer, that somehow you would not be able to access treatment from three to six months. In many instances, that's too late. No woman in this country should ever have to be denied coverage like that. Uh, and in many instances, Dean, the folks in Canada are able to come into this country to get treatment that they need. And those are the kind of stories that I've heard. So in fact, here in Washington, we are looking at trying to bring some experts in who have had a lot of experience with those programs. We need to take the time to make sure that we understand the consequences of a government plan, and I'm hopeful we'll be able to do that over the next several weeks here. Another tweet from Jack Cotton who says the congressman is avoiding the issue of insurance companies. He did not answer the concern about insurance company cooperation on the issue of health care changes. You know, I'm, first of all, I would say to the, tweet, the, the tweeter um, that... Do you, uh, do you tweet? <laughs> I, I tweet um, that uh, when Charlotte asked the situation about pre-existing conditions and we can't expect that insurance companies would necessarily cooperate, my response was this. The Republican plan has in there a requirement for flexibility in insurance coverage so that if someone does lose their job, they won't necessarily lose their health care and they can take it with them. That's what we need to be focused on. You're right. We need to give more control to individuals so that it is they who determine what kind of coverage they've got, whether they've got it. And that's why the Republican plan looks to provide individuals the same incentives through the tax code to purchase and have health care coverage as we do to businesses right now. We have to move in the direction uh, so that people can uh, participate in choosing the kind of care that they can access. This next question is one that um, we have heard a lot over the last couple of weeks, and it's from a viewer who said, asking, would Senator Kennedy, who we know is battling brain cancer, have had access to all of the high-tech care he is currently receiving if he were enrolled in his own plan? Well, I mean, that, that is, um, I think, the question of the day here. And there are many of us, uh, Steve, who think uh, that you put in place a government plan you will not have the type of quality of care or choice of coverage uh, the, way that, the way that we have now, those who have coverage now. Again, look at the cost of the Kennedy plan. They're astronomical. We can't afford in this country to provide those who make $110,000 a year uh, with government subsidies uh, because we don't have the revenues to pay for it. It's money we don't have. There are long-term consequences to doing that on the economy, and when you have a government stepping in and saying, we understand the, the procedures that are best fit for every patient. We understand what uh, you know, pharmaceuticals and medicines need to be administered by doctors. That says to the innovation and the research out there that it's only going to be Washington that has the ideas. It's only going to be Washington that knows how to diagnose patients. That is so counter to what most Americans know is the case, and that is the doctor-patient relationship is paramount. If we center on the patient and, and, and give credence to the fact that each individual patient and delivery of care is unique, we can't be controlling that here in Washington. We've got to allow for the flexibility and innovation out there for doctors to deliver the care that they know their patient needs. If you're listening on C-SPAN Radio, our conversation is with the House Republican Whip, Eric Cantor from Virginia. Rose is on the phone from Phoenix. Good morning. Hi there. Good morning, gentlemen. Yeah. I'm calling to just read a couple little um, lines from my local newspaper, the Arizona Republic, dated Sunday, June 14th, regarding AIDS drugs. And it says the state health...
Department of Health Services is slashing the number of free medications it provides to poor and uninsured HIV patients because it did not receive the level of federal funding it requested for its AIDS drug assistance program. The program's been in place since the mid-1990s. It will still cover essential and sexual antivirals that keep patients alive and fight infections. But beginning July 1st, it will no longer pay for more than 130 drugs that help patients manage the side effects of their disease. Drugs that have been cut from the coverage plan include pain relievers, antibiotics, medications that control chronic conditions such as diabetes and high cholesterol, and psychotopic drugs that treat anxiety and depression. Most are are common ailments in HIV patients. So this is just proof that the federal government does not help anyone, especially the poorest and the sickest. Well, Rose, let me respond to that because you raised the issue, I believe, of what um, what the government has as its at its disposal in order to control costs. And that is, at the end of the day, begin to ration care because there's no history whatsoever in Washington, Phoenix, or whatever state capital you want to name. No history that either party and government is able to adequately reduce costs. The only incidence of reduction in costs and delivery of health care has been existent in the private sector. In fact, I think it's the case that Medicare has increased um, well over 34% every year higher than other health care costs. Uh, so the government can't control costs. So the only way that it would end up doing so is reducing the amount of care or what coverage is provided. That's the only way. There's no efficiency and innovation, frankly, that will come out of Washington in delivery of health care. So your point is a very good one. And this email or this uh, tweet from Kat who says, Congressman, you're right, COBRA is insane for most of the folks who wish to have continued health care after leaving a job with health insurance. Absolutely, and it shows we've 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 even added to the insanity of of the increased cost of COBRA coverage and others this year in Congress. You know, we've gone in the wrong direction. What we need to do is put patients back in charge. You know, we need to be providing the subsidy for individuals in the individual market, not just businesses, to get out there and be able to choose what they need if they're put into a situation where they've got to access that type of coverage. Again, this goes back to the Republican plan. We've got in the plan the ability for individuals uh, to participate in a larger group of people so that the costs are brought down, so that risk for insurance companies are brought down, and that they can have the ability to choose basic coverage uh, for themselves. We have time for one more call. Marcello is on the phone from West Haven, Connecticut, for Congressman Eric Cantor. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, I'll be 80 this November. Happy birthday. Thank you. And uh, I've been a registered Democrat since I was 21. Now, as far as I'm concerned, both parties seem to want to spend money, one plan or another. But if uh, we go back, we started uh, to control with the HMOs. Now, this year alone, my HMO is going up $10 a month. Let's for the monthly pay. I'm going to stop you on that point because we just have a minute or two left. We'll give the Congressman a chance to respond to your situation. You know, I think, Marshall, I think you're right. I mean, both parties want to spend money. That means government is always wanting to spend more money, money that we don't have. Uh, and that's why we need to make sure that we are providing the flexibility out there for working families and small businesses to do what they know and they know how to do best, which is to efficiently um, bring down costs in any way possible uh, and that's where the parties are differing here in Washington. There are those at the White House and the Democrat side of the aisle who believe that government is the better provider for health care. There are those of us on the Republican side of the aisle who believe that a much more flexible, innovative situation can arise if we empower businesses and families uh, to, to make their own decisions uh, and ensure that you don't have government bureaucracies making decisions for you. 
I'm going to get a jump. I know you have, you're heading downstairs to appear upstairs, I guess, on MSNBC, but they will likely ask you about the situation in South Carolina. What's your response to Governor Sanford as now the former head of the Republican Governors Association? Well, oh, Steve, you know, look, um, I think the people in this country rightfully hold their elected officials to higher standards. Uh, I think that in his remarks yesterday, Governor Sanford addressed that. He apologized. Uh, I just have my thoughts and prayers focused on his family right now. And finally, if you were to run for president in 2012, what would you take into account? And have you thought about it? If he were to run for president? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not, not sure about the question there. I mean, I, obviously, um, I'm not intending to run for president, so I don't know what the question is. Your name is. has been mentioned as a possible contender is in yeah, look, I mean, th This country is facing whoever is the candidate for president on the side of the aisle. Um, and, you know, we as a party, I think, um, have now um, sort of positioned ourselves uh, to reclaim uh, the role of being the fiscal watchdog. American people are waking up to the cost and consequences <clears throat> of this Democrat agenda in Washington. We can't afford it. We're spending money we don't have, uh, and frankly, we're not focused on what we ought to be, which is job creation. Uh, and I think what you will see out of any Republican that is here in Congress uh, or uh, that will look to 2012, you will see a Republican very focused on the issues at hand right now for working families, which is they want a fair shot at reclaiming their economic security. Congressman Eric Cantor, we always appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us again here on C-SPAN. Steve, thank you. Come back again. Yes.